Okay, um, let's talk about some of the tools that liars use. This is this is you know when I was doing the research for this, the, to me this was the re- I thought really interesting part. Um, so maybe you could give us some examples of different things. Uh, the first one that I I noted and I wrote down was something called a parrot statement. So let's set up the premise. I assume the premise is that two people are talking and someone starts to use like tactics, liars tactics. And one, and one of them is a parent sta- parrot parrot statement, right? What let's talk about that. Yeah, so when you're when you're trying to figure out if someone's lying, you want to get a sense of their norm first of all, kind of what's their baseline? How are you? How was your weekend? Did you go shopping? How are the kids? You're trying to get a sense of what's normal because it's really if someone veers from their norm, like if someone's all stressed out, it doesn't mean anything, particularly if they're a stressed person. If they're normally very calm and you probe them with a question and it stresses them, then that's significant because they've left their baseline. Mm. I mean, that said, we look at kind of verbal and nonverbal indicators of deceit. And what we find is it's only the first few seconds after a hard question is asked that's considered scientifically reliable. So if you ask somebody a question that's hard and they repeat the same question back at you, which is what we call a parrot statement, they're really stalling for time. So if if you say to someone, you know, where where were you on on the seventh when that car was stolen out of the parking lot? And they say, huh, where was I? Instead of answering the question, they're stalling. That's a parrot statement. Yeah, everything is about this this couple of moments in your mind where the liar's trying to get his or her story straight, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when the cognitive load is really high on your system and you're trying to think what to say, act composed, appear spontaneous, that's when you're going to leak these verbal and nonverbal indicators of deceit. So when you're interrogating someone or interviewing somebody, what you're really doing is very artfully, subtly raising the cognitive load with a set of questions that allows you to maintain rapport with them, but at the same time, get them a little bit uncomfortable should they be lying. So when you ask somebody to tell their story backwards, for example, that raises the cognitive load significantly, and you might see those indicators of deceit. If you start to ask them some harder questions, again, the cognitive load will be hard and high on them. They're going to be thinking, what should I say? So they're going to, they're maybe going to parrot back what you ask them. They might try to reason with you in some way and say, well, wait a minute. If I was in the parking lot and that car was stolen, why does my friend say we were in a meeting? You know, that's kind of a, they're just reasoning with you. Or they may protest the statement altogether and say, hold on, that's a ridiculous question to ask me. We call that questioning the question. Uh, Or they may make you try to make you feel really guilty and act like really offended by your question. Uh, or they may just use bolstering or bolstering language. You know, you know, to tell you the truth, as far as I can tell, qualifying language, you're not going to believe this. They might be overly verbose. When someone's telling the truth, they just will calmly answer your questions. And they'll also give you the attitude that they're on your side, that they want to help you get to the truth. And that subtle shift in attitude is really significant. Right. So, I mean, look, I think you just gave the gist of it there, right? The gist of it is um, one side, the truth the person that's trying to divine the truth um, makes it mentally challenging on the person that's trying to commit the deception. And the person that's trying to commit the deception does all these kind of mental gymnastics in order to either buy time or to align that person. Okay, so you talked about Paris statements. Uh, We didn't talk about dodgeball statements, did we? Well, sometimes somebody will kind of fish to try to figure out what you know. So, for example, they may say to you, um, well, did you have the cameras on in that parking lot that night? And so, you know, they're trying to figure out whether or not you have any information that they need in order to protect themselves, which is why oftentimes an interrogator will bait the person across the table from them and say, if I had the camera on, do you think we would see you in the parking lot? And they're just baiting. They're really just trying to suggest they're creating what one interrogator I know calls a mind virus on the part of the person across the table from them. A mind virus. Yeah. I'll be looking that up. Um, okay. We talked about guilt tip statements, which is uh, something that that you're offending me by doing that. We talked, let's see, protest statements. You mentioned that. Uh, okay, overly wordy statements. Um, oh, we didn't talk about uh, the, the invocation of religion. I swear to God on my mother's grave, I just wasn't in the parking lot. 
uh, oftentimes we see that associated I, with I, deception. I love that. I love that one. Um, you know, there's, there, there's, a, there's, there's, uh, so much done in the name of religion, isn't there? Um, let's see. Distancing statements. That's another tool also. Oh, did you, did you talk about that? Keeping yourself out uh, of the answer yeah, I mean, by name? In my TED talk, I talk about that. I put up Bill Clinton where he said, you know, I did not have sex with that woman, yes. Miss Lewinsky. So oftentimes somebody will distance themselves unconsciously from their subject. And so you want to pay attention to language. And if you're in the financial world, oftentimes we actually go back and we look, for example, at earnings calls. And you can actually see in the language when you go back and you do what's called statement analysis, where a CEO or a CFO, when they were defending something that may have gone wrong with a company's financials, they're actually using distancing language. Uh, so you, you, you might, you might look at that. You also want to look at what we call kind of soft replacement language euphemisms. So, you know, the rapist isn't going to say I raped her. You know, they're going to say I didn't touch her. You know, the embezzler isn't going to say, you know, I stole the money. They're going to say, I didn't take the money. So when someone starts to use soft replacement language, we saw this with Lance Armstrong a lot when he was defending his use of, uh, you know, his do his doping. He, he would say, you know, it wasn't much and it was just some materials. He wouldn't actually refer to the drugs themselves. And so those are euphemisms. Uh, he just settled, I think, uh, the other day for 15 million bucks or something ridiculous. Um, yeah. I yeah. have one. I have a question about... Um, verbal leaks or ticks. And that's, you know, you, you can explain what that is to us, but my wife asserts that, um, that doesn't necessarily mean people are lying. It, if you listen to me, it's just, I, I do it all the time. And it's just me trying to buy time while I'm thinking about what I want to say. It doesn't mean it's a lie. I'm with your wife on this one. Um, so you just heard me say, um, yeah. We punctuate our language all the time with little verbal leaks and ticks. It doesn't mean anything. What's significant is if someone really shifts from their norm. So if you're going to ask them a hard question and they've been in the middle of this incredibly fluent conversation with you, and by the way, you're not interviewing them on the press and this is not a legal interrogation where they're really parsing out their language carefully and you're just having a conversation – it doesn't mean anything if they do ums and ahs. If you ask them the hard question and then they pause for 10 seconds, that's significant. Or if they do the ums and the ahs for a much longer period of time than they normal do, normally do, then that's significant. But punctuating your language here and there with statements or with ums and ahs really doesn't mean anything. And so it tends to be quite quite common. Is it this and this it's the same with um, what's called frequency of disfluency? Um, that means likes, you knows, sighs. Is, is, it, is it the same thing or are those actually different? Well, you know, to tell you the truth and all honesty, that kind of qualifying language yeah. oftentimes is associated with deception. But again, you have to be careful because what we look for when we're interviewing somebody is two or three of these indicators on the verbal side, two or three of these indicators on the nonverbal side. And then we go in and we ask a lot harder questions. Mm -hmm. And we will confirm with facts and we'll go back and do our research. And so it's very, very important that you don't point the finger and say, ha ha, you said, you, you said, um, <laughs> you said, Jesus Christ, you said, you're lying. <laughs> and that's not the way it works. You really have to put all of your information together and start to see the full picture of the person across the table from you. There isn't that much magic in it. It takes a lot of, a lot of background research as well. So what you're saying is that doesn't, mean yes, it means keep looking. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly right. When you see red flags, that means you're going to funnel down and ask harder questions. 